and i would like to tell the participants that professor swanton is a distinguished academic uh, translator critic and he has uh, done a lot of work in regional languages also and i would like ayush to introduce him officially thank you ma'am uh, good morning sir Santan Das Gupta sir is head of the Department of Comparative Literature at Jadavpur University. He is also coordinator Center for Translation of Indian Literatures and joint director School of Media Communication and Culture there. He is currently secretary of the Comparative Literature Association of India and member of the advisory board English of the Sahit Academy. His book publications include as translator Grish Chandra Ghosh's Tit for Tat and as editor A Season of Stories, contemporary Indian short stories and translation. Call of the Hills, a course book of Indian Nepali literature in translation, and most recently Darit Lekhika, Women's Writing in Bangla. He has also edited anthologies. like a south asian nationalism reader and written books like sham selvadurai text and context and indian english literature historiography he currently edits the jadavpur journal of comparative literature we welcome you sir in aligarh muslim university thank you ayush Yes, sir. Please. Shall I begin? Yes, ma'am. Thank yes, you. Yes, sir. Please, please go. Uh, good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers. Uh, I would like to thank Kaligar Muslim University for giving me this opportunity of sharing my thoughts on the topic with you, and uh, it is a privilege uh, addressing a gathering as diverse as this, and I look forward. to learning from you from your perspectives because any refresher course is obviously an interaction between colleagues more than anything else so i will be putting forward some perspectives some of my perspectives related to comparative literature and i will be sharing some of our experiences with comparative literature at jadavpur university kolkata which is uh, which was the first department for the study of comparative literature that was set up in india and i will be sharing some of our experiences perspectives and i will be looking forward to learning uh, from your responses on the issues that crop up during the discussion uh, i i will share a powerpoint with you uh, please give me a minute to put this into place right yes um is the screen visible to everybody yes sir yes sir thank you no sir yes sir it is visible yes, yes sir yes. it is go to it is. go to presentation mode sir no we can see sir sir uh, press f5 sir yes yes is that fine now yes sir thank yes, you sir. absolutely absolutely please thank you very much so uh, the topic uh, the title that i decided on for this particular discussion is contextualizing comparative literature where i'll be trying to look at the different contexts in which comparative literature emerges the academic uh, contexts but i'll be trying to focus largely on india up to a certain point of time uh when we talk about comparative literature perhaps uh, the best way is to start from the larger context of the humanities in india itself and as all of you are aware uh, the last few decades have seen some very significant transformations as far as the pedagogy of the humanities is concerned in india there are many many changes that have occurred in the humanities in india uh the humanities have literally been reinvented so much so that the humanities don't really mean today 
what it used to mean to us even 20 years back. Our expectations, our expectations from the humanities today are probably again very different from what our expectations were from the humanities a couple of decades ago. And uh, along with this, we have seen a radical reformulation of the curricula in many departments across the humanities as it is practiced in India. So what used to be taught in departments of English literature, for instance, and you are palpably aware of this because many of you, all of you, are from different English literature departments across the country, and you are palpably aware, I'm sure, of the major changes that have happened within the curriculum of English literature itself. And that is also true, perhaps, of other departments and disciplines in the humanities and the social sciences. So departments of history, for instance, again in India, have, have, have broached into completely new territory. And uh, there are major overlaps that are developing between different departments and disciplines, between history and literature and uh, international relations uh, and, uh, inter and so on and so forth. Along with this reformulation of curricula in the humanities in India, we have also seen a rediscovery of the use of the, of the, of the utility of the student of the humanities in industry. There was a time not very long ago where the student would be uh, by and large in many places discouraged from taking up the humanities because the idea was that you don't get a job if you, if you study in the humanities. This was definitely true uh, uh, of my experiences when I started to study humanities, you know, uh, several decades back. Now, all of this seems to have changed significantly. I think it would be fair to say that today, this notion uh, is something we have left behind us. And students who emerge from the humanities in different universities in India, by and large, have some kind of a foothold in the job market. So the industry has woken up to the uh, to the specific skill sets, uh, to the specific training that the student of the humanities can bring in. And that is given more recognition today, perhaps, than it was maybe 20 years or 30 years back. Another significant development in recent years has been the emergence of private players in the education sector. Now, um, every new development has its positive sides and its negative sides. If, uh, there are new opportunities and there are new problems that come up with any change. And one of the opportunities, one of the positive developments, I would say, that have emerged from the emergence of private universities has been that on many occasions, private universities seem to have been more open to moving away from the earlier compartmentalization between traditional departments. This is one of the things that has happened. Private universities may have done this for their in their own interest to make their courses more marketable or whatever it is. But the fact is that the earlier rigid compartmentalization that used to exist between different departments, this has gradually broken down. And one of the contributors to this dismantling of this rigid departmental compartmentalization has been many private universities that have cropped up in India. So along with all of these developments, reformulation of curricula, reshaping of pedagogy, uh, emergence of uh, private public universities, uh, uh, new dynamics, what we have seen is a greater degree of what is today called interdisciplinarity and of interdepartmentality. So as the older hostilities, as the older watertight boundaries between 
different departments in the university structure breaks down in India, we are able to witness greater cross-fertilization, cross-pollination of ideas between and among experts from different departments, from different disciplines. So uh, what, what, what I'm pointing to is a development that has been taking shape over the last several decades and which has come to a head now and which is the gradual dismantling of the isolation in which different departments used to work. A gradual... Uh, excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. Uh, you're, not, you're, you're not audible. Uh, you know, it's very low and, and your screen is not visible to the participants. Oh. No, ma'am. The screen is visible. Okay. No, uh, PPT is not visible, ma'am. PPT is not visible. PPT, sir, PPT. Will, you, will you please uh, share once again, sir? Yes, I'm sharing once again. Okay. Uh, just a second, please. Um, yes, is it visible now? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Had it gone off last time? Yeah, yes. yeah, sometimes. Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, please feel free to just interrupt me if that happens again, and uh, I shall try to do whatever it takes. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, just to get back to what we were discussing. We were talking about a breakdown, a breaking down of the older departmental structure where there used to be, or we used to imagine, a rigid compartmentalization between what a department of English would do, what a department of Bangla would do, a department of uh, history would do. And this change is affecting both curriculum, what we teach, and pedagogy in many significant ways. It is obviously opening up newer fields of study. So as you are aware, English literature departments at one point of time would traditionally teach only English literature from uh, the UK. This, of course, uh, changed over the decades and it broadened out into incorporating US American English literature. Uh, Canadian literature, Australian literature. And then there was a further opening up. I'm just talking from the perspective of English. Uh, there was a further opening up as Indian English literature made its inroads into the curriculum. And then finally, I think we have been seeing the incorporation of Indian Bhasha literature as well within the curriculum of English, English literature department. So this has been true of various departments and disciplines in the humanities in India, newer fields of study being included within the curriculum of universities. Similarly, we have seen a transgression of genre and media. Many new genres, many new media have worked their way into the curriculum of the humanities in India. So today, it is no longer the novel and the short story and the lyric that would be studied legitimately within the literature syllabus of departments in the humanities in India, but it is quite possible to teach and study, for instance, the comic book as a genre. So there's a new genre and a new medium that works its way into the syllabus. Um, and this is true of many different fields, many different genres can be imagined. Cyber culture works its way into the, into, into the curriculum, folklore works its way into the curriculum and so on and so forth. So uh, these are some of the ways in which this spirit of inclusion, the spirit of opening up has manifested itself in uh, the humanities in India. This opening up has meant, number one, a breaking down of the isolation in which we used to work at one point of time, a breaking down of the rigid compartmentalization of specializing departments, and it has also meant a broadening, broadening out to include different 
kinds of texts, different kinds of genres, different kinds of media within the curriculum. Film is done regularly now in so many literature departments today. The comic book, the graphic narrative has become part and parcel of the curriculum. All of, all of this is a pointer uh, towards the direction in which the humanities in India has been heading. It has been heading from isolation to collaboration. It has been heading from compartmentalization and rigid structure to perhaps opening up and espousing um, more and more from outside what was traditionally seen to be its field and area of expertise. This has also opened up the doors to collaboration between different departments, faculty with different specializations and disciplines. So we are seeing the emergence of different kinds of new disciplines, perhaps. This, of course, we have seen in the sciences as well, where uh, physics and economics have come together, where biology and physics today, it's very difficult to separate the two. There are fields of study which have emerged, taking the expertise from different disciplines. And this is something that we are seeing in the humanities as well, where somebody from history with a certain expertise can contribute in a more significant way to the teaching of literature and vice versa. The last point that I would like to make over here in this slide is that this opening up, this embracing of a spirit of accommodation, inclusion, this tendency to offer a holistic picture of the development of literature is something that was always implicit in the way the discipline of comparative literature was defined, enunciated, and practiced, at least in India. This may or may not have been true for the larger international context for the USA and France. But in the Indian context, this opening up was always part of how comparative literature was envisaged. Okay, So the very idea of comparative literature as it took place, as it took birth in India, was predicated upon the desire to break out of the single language axis to leave behind the singular and to embrace the plural. Because comparative literature, by definition, it talks about comparison. And if we talk about comparison, surely we are talking about the many rather than the one. Comparative literature suggests an alternative approach to the language axis. Instead of studying vertically, the development of a language literature, comparative literature suggests the deployment of a horizontal approach, which means instead of studying how the literature written in one language evolves across time, across periods, chronologically, ancient age, classical age, medieval age, modern age, instead of doing that, comparative literature will suggest it is even possible to look at comparatively literary works from different languages and different countries written around the same point of time. That's the horizontal axis of literary studies. Again, whereas single literature, the study of a single literature in its traditional sense, I'm emphasizing this because the study of single literatures is absolutely no longer what it used to be. In the traditional sense, the study of a single literature would be predicated upon focusing on an in-depth study of only the literary texts written in that particular language. On the other hand, comparative literature would suggest breaking out of that, of that axis, challenging the primacy of language in the studying of literature, and taking an approach that would mean an in breadth study of literature. So in depth study versus in breadth study. This is what comparative literature promised to do. And in this promise lay the seeds of all these developments which we are seeing today by and large in the humanities in India. 
a breaking down of the older departmental rigid, rigid structure, the compartmentalization, the development, the emergence of new fields of study, the attempt to include multiple genres and multiple media within our curricula. All of this seems to have been anticipated by comparative literature in its early days in India. This is what I will try and argue. At this point, I would like to briefly mention the concept of academic social responsibility, ASR, which has been gaining some currency in recent times. This is one of the themes on which Jadupur has been working, comparative literature has been working. The concept of academic social responsibility is actually very simple. It implies that as teachers, as academics, we have a certain responsibility towards society, which we do not discharge merely by taking a certain number of classes, merely by satisfying the demands of APIs. The responsibility of an academic ranges to including a certain contribution to society as a whole. And this responsibility may be seen to manifest itself in several different ways. It would manifest itself in the shaping of a curriculum that would have a certain social contribution, a certain focus on society. And therein, it could manifest itself in what has been called a quest for relevance, which is a much older concept, as we all know. It could also manifest itself in terms of outreach, whereby we try to take the university outside the four walls of the university. Is it possible to look at alternative pedagogies where uh, 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 taking education into society outside the university is an option, is an alternative? As is evident from this, the concept of academic social responsibility is not at all something very new. It can surely be mapped along with Gogi Wathyango's idea of the quest for relevance, where he discusses about how uh, um, what is taught in the university classrooms in the African continent must have a bearing, must have some uh, impact on the lives and lifestyles of the students who are being taught. Surely, academic social responsibility has some kind of an antecedent in Googie's uh, idea of quest for relevance. Similarly, the Center for Cultural Studies um, at the University of Birmingham in the UK, which is said to have been the birthplace of cultural studies, um, one remembers that the agenda of the Center for Cultural Studies was to take academics, to take education beyond the uh, uh, ivory tower activity that it was at that point of time. And Richard Hoggart's point was, and this is something that Stuart Hall has written about as uh, he as he writes about the history of the CCL. The point was to take, to study the lives of the working class people outside the university as a text. So the lives and lifestyles themselves would be the text that cultural studies would be looking at. Once again, the idea was to move beyond the printed text and to incorporate a larger context within academia, to embed that context within curriculum as prescribed by the university. So this, again, as, as we can understand, uh, can be seen to be some kind of an antecedent to the idea of academic social responsibility. So without antecedents, we are nothing. Every idea has a, a precursor to it. And my suggestion is that all of these 
um, notions that are highlighted over here, all of which actually talk about a spirit of inclusion, uh, all, about, all of which talk about breaking out from the older boundaries, transgressing the older boundaries. All of this is implicit in the formulation of the idea of comparative literature. In very simple terms, Comparative literature involves studying multiple literatures. As we all know, multiple literatures from different languages, different countries, they can be mapped together. In other words, according to some, in a very basic uh, definition, comparative literature could be defined as the study of world literature. If this is a definition that we accept, that theoretically comparative literature can study world literature, defined as literatures from all over the world, then a whole gamut of questions opens up in front of us. As we jettison the language axis, it becomes possible for us to think about understanding the interrelationships that exist between languages, between literatures, between nations. And these relationships obviously transgress, challenge and decimate perhaps the claims of boundaries and borders. Boundaries and borders that separate language from language, nation from nation. So questions such as how does literature travel across borders? This is a question that becomes very important for comparative literature and this is a question that we can now legitimately probe if we do comparative literature. So we are all aware of the fact that literature does not obey the truth claims of borders between countries. Literature travels. Literature is an itinerant entity. One remembers how the Katha Sarit Sagar which had this tale about the switching of heads. One man's head getting switched onto another man's body. This is a tale that inspires Thomas Mann, the German writer, to uh, write an adaptation of this. He writes this novella in German, which is translated as the transposed heads in English. This is inspired by the Kathasarit Sagar. So the tale of the Kathasarit Sagar travels from India to Germany. And Thomas Mann, of course, adapts the tale to his own political purpose, to his own historical context. Now, the same tale, again, influences, inspires, influences. These are key words for comparative literature, of course. This influences Girish Karnat, who uses the same theme, the same storyline, to write a play called Hayavadan. So we see how literature travels. The same tale travels from India to Europe and comes back again, this time to modern India. This, this, this kind of travel, this kind of relationships, these are things that comparative literature will allow us to focus on. And this will probably give us a more holistic picture than we would get if we focused only on the Kathasarit Sagar or only on Hayavadan, because this is the history that gives rise to this text. This is not a history we can abjure. Again, questions such as how do translations or adaptations influence literary creations? all related to the question of influence. How do genres influence each other? How do genres move across literatures? One genre emerges in a certain form, in one language, in one culture. But again, it travels. The genre travels to foreign lands and it, it sort of creates its uh, followers in that foreign land. The novel, for instance. It is impossible to talk about the rise of the novel, as we know, without moving across languages, across countries. One thinks of the long prose narratives, the episodic narratives that emerged in different countries of Europe. 
One thinks of, for instance, Boccaccio's, Giovanni Boccaccio's Decameron, which is a series of short prose narratives strung together to make a larger prose narrative, which is what the novel is going to turn out to be. Similarly, from the Italian, one can think of the Spanish tradition, the tradition of the picaresque novel, which is again episodic. Several short narratives strung together to form a larger prose narratives where the only connecting thread is the figure of the protagonist who is the picaro, the orphan who is trying to survive in a cruel world. And then to connect this with the French naturalist realist tradition of novel writing. So, you know, uh, the, the, inter the entire trajectory of the emergence of a genre is something that perhaps we can map more easily, more holistically, if one goes beyond the language axis and accommodates the study of multiple language literatures uh, together within the same breath. These are some of the questions that comparative literature might prod us towards. Some common questions that come up when we talk about comparative literature are these. Susan Bassnett, in her very popular book of, on comparative literature, defines comparative literature as the study of literatures in relation to each other. So literatures of the world, multiple literatures being studied comparatively. As comparative literature defines itself in these terms, there is a very interesting implication that emerges from this, and that is that the discipline envisages a single, one worldwide civilization. In other words, there is a quest for the universal that underlies the idea of comparative literature. When can comparison take place? Comparison takes place where there are certain similarities, where different bodies, different entities may be seen to belong to the same paradigm. It is only then that they can be compared. So comparative literature suggests that there is a worldwide civilization and this civilization is dynamic. It is formed through a continuous mutual exchange of ideas, Adan Pradhan. The concept of Adan Pradhan is intrinsic, organic to the idea of comparative literature. It is because we influence each other it is because no one writes in isolation that comparative literature makes sense to us. Another point that comes up is that comparative literature is not just the study of literature, but it is the study of literature in relation to other arts. Other arts? painting, art, sculpture, music, film, of course, theater, all of these arts. Is it possible to study the printed book in relation to these other art forms? Today, this question seems to have become less contentious as more and more departments are incorporating courses, modules related to studying a novel in comparison to the film version that has been made out of the novel. But this is something that was always, perhaps, if not always, that was for a long time, part and parcel of the way comparative literature was defined. This was anticipated by the discipline of comparative literature. The key word for comparative literature is perhaps connection. Because comparative literature involves studying the multiple, studying the many, the question that emerges is how to make sense of this diversity. How to make sense of this excess. It is important to be able to connect the texts that we are uh, uh, thinking of constituting our curriculum. 
in a meaningful way. So the challenge for comparative literature is not just in incorporating more and more, not just in terms of expanding and extending the uh, frontiers of our discipline, but it is also about how to deal with this surfeit of matter, how to make sense, how to connect across time and across space. But if we can do that, then the comparative literature promise is to offer a more holistic and a more overall view of literature, a view that would be more inclusive and more comprehensive because it would not restrict itself to only one language. It would look at the interrelationships that exist between writers of different languages. Another notion that comes up in relation to comparative literature is that comparative literature is actually not a very high falutine discipline. It is not some esoteric subject. Rather, comparative literature and what it means to us is actually something that is very commonsensical. This is again something that Susan Bassnett offers. It is very commonsensical because we as human beings make sense of the literary through comparison. It is impossible to understand Chaucer except by comparing him with Boccaccio. It is impossible to understand Shakespeare without referring to the Latin sources. It is impossible to understand Romanticism, which is, as we know, a pan-European phenomenon, without referring to Romantic poets in the different languages. If we study Wordsworth, it is important to study Lamartine from the French tradition and see how similar their ideals are, their poetry is, uh, their perspectives on, the, on what poetry should be are. So for instance, just to look at the Chaucer-Boccaccio comparison. As we all know, Chaucer is best known for the Canterbury Tales, which is about a group of pilgrims. And as they go on this pilgrimage, the pilgrims indulge in a storytelling bout. So there is this larger narrative of the pilgrimage, pilgrims going on a pilgrimage, that's the larger narrative. And within that narrative, which acts as a frame, we find the different stories that are told to us, that are narrated by the characters in the larger story. So there's an outside tale and there are many inside tales. It's a framed narrative. This is the structure that Chaucer envisages. Now, after reading Chaucer, if we come across Giovanni Boccaccio's Decameron, 1340 to 1400, 1313 to 1375. There is an overlap, right? What do we find in the Decameron? The Decameron is about a group of 10 young men and women fleeing Florence, because this is the time when the plague hits Florence. And these people decide to leave Florence so that they don't get infected. And it's a 10 day long journey to the countryside. They're trying to make it to the countryside where there would be less chance of infection. And how do they spend their time on the journey? They decide to narrate stories to each other. So 10 storytellers within a larger story telling 10 stories every day, close to around 100 stories. What do we notice? We notice immediately that this is exactly the structure followed by Chaucer, a framed narrative. There is a larger narrative and within it there are many smaller narratives, shorter narratives, which are given to us by the characters of the larger narrative. What this means is that there are similarities between those, these two texts that will become apparent to us the moment we read these two texts. In other words, it is al almost commonsensical for us to compare. The moment we read Boccaccio, we will be comparing in our minds and trying to understand Decameron in terms of the Canterbury Tales. That is why Susan Bassnett suggests there is something instinctive, there is something commonsensical about comparative literature. 
And in that sense, perhaps, even if we do not do comparative literature officially, perhaps we do comparative literature because surely even in single literature departments and disciplines, comparison is something that comes in. Another very important area for comparative literature, and I'm sure you have already been discussing this, is translation studies. This is very important for comparative literature because the study of comparative literature today is based upon translations to a very large extent. The moment comparative literature suggests a reading of world literature, what is implicit there is the idea of reading literature in translation because it is impossible for any department, for the faculty members of any department, for the students of any department to have access to all the languages of the world. Therefore, perhaps the only way of reading world literature would be through translation in the, in the classroom. And if we are incorporating works of translation into the syllabus, then immediately the question that would come up is, are we reading the original text if we are reading the translations or are these counterfeit versions of the text? We all know that there is so much that threatens to get lost in translation. We can give any number of examples. We can think of Kurtulin Haider's Agka Darya, and we can think of Kurtulin Haider's Agka Darya as translated into English as River of Fire by Kurtulin Haider, the author herself. And we all know the kind of changes that the writer herself makes when she steps into the garb of the translator. So the old, old question is, are we reading the original text if we are reading the translation? And the moment we ask this question, we are doing, we are venturing into the realms of translation studies. That is why translation studies is organic uh, to the study of comparative literature. There is, of course, a love-hate relationship between translation studies and comparative literature. As you know, translation studies emerges to a very large extent from within comparative <laughs> As you know, translation studies emerges from within the realms of comparative literature. But in later years, translation studies gains its own independence and it turns into a full-fledged discipline by itself. Nevertheless, it remains intrinsic to understanding comparative literature. Influence, reception, impact, these are all very important concepts for comparative literature as comparative literature goes beyond the boundaries of language and nation. The question of language has often been most vexing as the humanities has tried to breach the boundaries, the older borders. The question that has come up again and again is how to deal with the plurality of languages. Today, in most institutions where comparative literature is taught, texts in translation are resorted to as a matter of rule rather than a matter of exception. Although at the higher research level, uh, it is desirable, most institutions will enforce that students work with texts in the original languages. As a subject, comparative literature today is taught at some of the uh, most influential uh, uh, universities across the world. It is a subject that is taught in many different institutions. And in India, it exists as named courses, named departments, named centers in uh, a few universities. This list is longer than it was a couple of decades ago. However, what is important to note is that why, while the number of departments of comparative literature in India is not very large. It is still something that you can count on your fingers, probably. The influence of comparative literature has been more widespread so that we can talk about perhaps many unnamed comparative literature 
departments in India. What do I mean by unnamed comparative literature departments? I mean that today our pedagogy in the humanities has evolved so much, has changed so much that perhaps it would be fair to suggest that in many places we are doing what might be called comparative literature, even though that very valuable work, that very valuable research is being carried on within departments that might have the names Department of English, Department of Bangla, Department of Hindi, and so on and so forth. Because as I was mentioning, and as you are all very, very aware of, no longer do English literature departments teach only English literature from England. The linguistic boundary, the national boundary, have both been breached by literary studies. That is why perhaps uh, it is time to recognize that even departments Dr. Kamni Kumar, please switch off the, your screen. I mean, there's a, there's some problem here. Please, Dr. Kamni Kumar. Yes. Um, is is my uh, slide still visible? Uh, so somebody else uh, has. Yes, sir. It's visible. Yes, sir. It's visible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please switch off the screen. Okay, uh, please let yes. me know. If it is not visible, I shall stop sharing and then start it again. Can you see yeah, visible? Yes, it's visible. Please Thank start. You. Good. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the point that I'm trying to make is that perhaps comparative literature has proliferated more extensively across the humanities in India than we might think initially. The name may not be very common. There may be only a few departments and centers of comparative literature. But what comparative literature says and does is something that is today being practiced in many, many departments in the humanities, be they departments of English, departments of Gujarati, departments of Oriya, and so on and so forth. What is it that comparative literature champions? It champions a spirit of inclusion. It champions studying the many as opposed to the one. It champions a spirit of accommodation which goes beyond, which transgresses the boundaries of language and nation and tries to bring within the purview of the curriculum uh, 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 different languages, different literatures, different cultures from across the world. And this is something that we are seeing happening right now today in so many, many departments in the humanities. One of the criticisms that often comes up against comparative literature is that of dilettantism. The question that comes up is, it is difficult enough to understand the development of one language literature, English language literature, for instance, because there is so much there. And you are suggesting that we study not just English. We study English in comparison with, side by side with French, German, Spanish, Hindi, uh, Bangla, and so on and so forth. How is it possible to study so much? This is such a vast body of works, and it is so diverse. How can one possibly make sense of such a huge and heterogeneous body of work? Well, comparative literature has this concept of the methodology triad. Now, before I talk to you about this methodology triad, which I'm sure many of you are already aware of, uh, let me just issue the statutory warning that there is nothing absolutely sacred about this methodology triad. These are just three ways in which comparative literature can be done. There can be many, many, many other such ways. Okay. Thematology, genealogy, and historiography. These have been the most popular and widely accepted modes of approaching comparative literature. These are modes that allow us to connect, to go back to that very important word highlighted by Susan Bassnett. They allow us to connect texts from different languages, from different countries, from different time periods, and to make sense of that, of them, so that some kind of a pattern 
emerges from our study of these literary texts. Thematology is defined as the study of themes across literatures. Themes meaning subject matter, the content. What is it that the text is written about? So for instance, if we take heroism as a thematic, the hero as the theme. And if we look at the Iliad, for instance, the Iliad is a text that is about the public world. It's set in the public world. It's set in the battlefield primarily. What is it that makes the hero of the Iliad the hero? Perhaps we will all agree that in the Iliad, the hero is a hero because of his, and here it is his, it's not his or her. It's, it's, it's a primarily masculine space that is being emphasized in the Iliad. The hero becomes the hero because of his physical prowess, his brute strength on the battlefield. This is what makes the hero the hero, perhaps. That's the definition of heroism in the Iliad. But when we come to the Odyssey, the other Greek primary epic, the hero of the Odyssey is Odysseus. And what is it that makes him the hero? What is the idea? How is the theme of hero in the Odyssey treated? Odysseus is a very different hero. We remember how Odysseus tried not to go into the battle. He tried to avoid having to go to the Battle of Troy by pretending to be mad. We are all aware of that story. So surely bravery on the battlefield, valor, is not what defines the heroism of Odysseus. The primary epics have the, these epithets for each character. They served as mnemonic devices to jog the uh, uh, teller's memory. And the epithet that is used for Odysseus is nimble-witted. Nimble-witted Odysseus. Which means that the idea of heroism in the Odyssey is already something different from the idea of heroism in the Iliad. The theme of heroism has changed. Root strength, physical prowess, to intelligence. It's intelligence that makes Odysseus the hero of the Odyssey. We come down to a text like the Ramayana. Well, there are of course so many Ramayanas and Rama has been imagined in different ways. The idea of heroism is different. But by and large, if we go back to Valmiki, perhaps, perhaps one way of defining the hero in the Valmiki Ramayana could be in terms of the concept of the Dharma. The hero is the man who manages to discharge his dharma. Dharma, of course, an untranslatable word here, and I'm not trying to translate it. Dharma as a son, dharma as a husband, dharma as a king, dharma as a prince, and so on and so forth. So the hero seems to be the person who subscribes to the code of dharma. The point that I'm trying to make is, using one theme, it is possible to connect texts from diverse languages, from diverse countries. How the same theme is treated differently. And we can do the same with respect to texts that are non-canonical. So far, we have been taking, talking about canonical texts, Iliad, Odyssey, Ramayana. What about the comic book narratives, like the Spider-Man? Batman, for instance. Is it possible to read these texts within our curriculum using theme as the connecting uh, uh, thread? The theme of heroism, how does it change? Batman is the problematic hero. He's the hero who has this sense of guilt. <coughs> I'm sorry. Driving him on. He's a vigilante. He's a vigilante and there's something dark. He's, an, he's the dark hero, as it were. Spider-Man, the comic book Spider-Man. What's the idea of the heroism in the Spider-Man? Again, very, very different, very problematic. He is the hero who loses. He's the loser. He seems to lose every time. 
be it when it comes to his girl, be it when it comes to his newspaper editor, not being able to satisfy him by get, getting a damning picture of Spider-Man, and so on and so forth. He's always misunderstood. So how the idea of heroism changes as we travel from one text to another, from one language to another, from one country to another, from one time period to another. Using theme as the point of entry, we can perhaps connect, going back to that keyword again, we can perhaps connect different kinds of texts together. And the same would be true of genealogy and historiography using genre and history writing. I'm not going into details about these because I would like to focus on a different context. We are all aware of the history of comparative literature internationally. We know how uh, uh, France contributed to the development of comparative literature in its initial years. And we are also aware of these landmarks for the development of the discipline of comparative literature. Any self-respecting uh, uh, narrative of the history of comparative literature goes back to Goethe, the German philosopher, novelist, poet, essayist, you know, everything, everything. Goethe, in 1827, uses the term wealth literatur, which roughly would translate into world literature. And he spoke about how he felt that the time for national literature was now gone and that it was time for world literature. Once again, what Goethe was talking about, even though he did not use the words comparative literature, he was talking about a breaking down of the rigid compartmentalization. He was talking about challenging the truth claims of language and nation. He was talking about expanding one's horizons to include literature from the world, from other languages, from other countries. Surely that has some relevance to comparative literature. And there are all these landmarks that all of us are uh, aware of. One landmark that is of particular importance to us in India is Rabindranath Tagore's lecture at the National Council of Education in Kolkata. The National Council of Education was a body that was set up as part of the nationalist movement. It was trying to offer an alternative education system, an alternative to the colonial education that was being propagated by the British in those days. And someone from the National Council of Education invited Rabindranath and asked him to speak on comparative literature. And Rabindranath Chagor accepted the invitation and spoke on comparative literature only. He made a brief point. He said, what you have named comparative literature, let me give a new name to this. Let me call it Vishwa Sahitya, Vishwa Sahitya, world literature, world literature, sounds similar. He gives it the name Vishwa Sahitya and then he goes on to talk about his idea of Vishwa Sahitya slash comparative literature. He, he sets up two alternatives. One is narrow provincialism, Kupo Mondukata, narrow provincialism, and the other is something that is beyond provincialism and opening up. He suggests one option to us could be restricting ourselves within boundaries that exist, within borders that exist. And the other option could be to free ourselves of these self-imposed shackles of these arbitrary artificial fetters and go beyond what we were looking at earlier. And he chooses the latter. He suggests we must strive to see the work of each another as a whole. The work of each another as a whole, implying perhaps that whatever is being write, written in Germany, whatever is being write, written in Japan, whatever is being written in Bangla, all of this is part of one whole, some kind of a universalist quest. They are all connected in some way because all human beings are connected in some way or the other. There is something essentially human 
in the creation of literature, irrespective of which part of the world it comes from, which language it is written in. And therefore, we must dismantle the artificial barriers, boundaries of language and nation and look at the works of each another as one whole. Breaking down, dismantling of structure, embracing the many in opposition to the one. Surely, this is comparative literature, as Rabindranath was envisaging it. Surely, this is what we are seeing in today's developments in the humanities in India. And yet, Rabindranath does not stop here. He goes on to say, we must strive to see the work of each another as a whole, and that whole as part of man's universal creativity. Now, if we pause here for a minute to think about what he implies, he is suggesting that it is not even enough to study the literary works of each other as one whole, but we need to go beyond that to look at all these creations as part of man's universal creativity. In other words, perhaps Rabindranath is suggesting going beyond the printed word. Perhaps Rabindranath is suggesting, and he has done so in so many different cases, that perhaps we need to look at human creativity in general universal creativity which manifests itself in so many different art forms, in so many different genres, in so many different media. Rabindranath, of course, is one who champions the studying of literature and art, so interested in painting, for instance. That's clear even when he writes about literature, Prachin Shahitto, when he writes about ancient literature. He talks about not just literature, but about painting as well. So the idea of comparative literature, the idea of breaking down the strict definition of literature and embracing perhaps the idea of Sahitya, which is much broader, is something that comes from Rabindranath here. And this is something that percolates into the definition of comparative literature as it has been practiced in India. And this has today percolated into literary studies in general, I would, I, I would suggest, in the humanities in India. This is now becoming part and parcel of the way we in the humanities are approaching the idea of literary studies, whichever department our affiliation be to. Another important landmark is 1919, where Sir Ashutosh Mukherjee helps to found the first department of modern Indian languages. And he also talks about championing the cause of Jatiyo Shahitto. Now there is a contradiction here. This is a beautiful contradiction because Jatiyo Shahitto, one might feel tempted to translate this as national literature. And we all know, we have, we remember Goethe's pronouncements about how he sets up Wealth literature, well literature, comparative literature, Bishu Shahitto, in opposition to national literature. They are opposed to each other. Looking at the world is an alternative to looking at national literature for Goethe. And that is true of many thinkers in the Western world. In the Indian context, when Ashutosh Mukherjee enunciates the concept of Jatiyo Shahitto, what happens is something different though. Because we must remember the context of India is very, very different from the context of the European countries. India, with its diversity, constitutes a very different ground. The national and the world are not entirely opposed to each other in the Indian context. Because what is Indian is actually a miniature of the world. There is such diversity in our country. We may have 22 languages officially, but the People's Linguistic Survey of India, which concluded its work recently, concluded that we have more than 600 languages. Given this kind of diversity, is it possible to talk about national literature in opposition to the concept of world literature? Or is India a miniaturization of the world and is any attempt to do Indian national literature, 
bound to be an exercise in competitive literature. Because the moment we are talking about Indian literature, we have to talk about literature in so many different languages together. The next landmark is, of course, 1956, which marks the beginning of the official history of comparative literature in India, the setting up of the first named department of comparative literature. Soon, the University of Calcutta introduces courses within the syllabus of Bangla, which are from beyond Bangla. So that's part of the influence of comparative literature as Shishir Kumar Dash has uh, uh, analyzed it. This is how we see comparative literature beginning to have an impact, where the single literature department, the department of Bangla, opens up to including English and Sanskrit literature within its syllabus. And in 1974, the MIL department of the University of Delhi, it starts a new course, not on comparative literature, but on comparative Indian literature. This is different from comparative literature, and yet it borrows from the older idea of comparative literature. This is a further development. This comes up almost by way of a reaction to how comparative literature was being practiced at Jadupur before this. The stress of Jadupur was on the world, yes. It was on some aspects of Indian literature, yes. But there was not, in the initial years, too much of a focus on India outside Bengal. This was one of the points of criticism about comparative literature as it emerged at Jadupur initially. And almost as response to this, MIL department starts focusing specifically on India. So comparative literature, but in the context of Indian languages and literatures. That's one trajectory that starts off in 1974, as far as the pedagogy of comparative literature, as far as the history of comparative literature in India is concerned. Uh, I'm just skipping a few points. In the initial phase of comparative literature at Jadupur, and I'm talking about Jadupur because at that time, this was the only department for the study of comparative literature. In its initial years, there were three core areas of focus. The first thrust area was Bangla literature because it was thought to be the living literature of the land because Jadupur was located in Bengal. The second was Sanskrit literature because it was seen to be the root from which Bangla literature emerged. And the third thrust area was Western literature, not English literature, but Western literature. Again, that was part of the, uh, uh, it, it was part of the anti-colonial stance perhaps. These three were the thrust areas because these were seen to be most relevant to the student of literature at Jadavpur University. Because the immediate environment was that of Bangla, the root, Sanskrit, and Western literature, because it impacted modern Indian literatures so extensively. As is clear, we can locate perhaps some kind of a quest for relevance in the selection of these thrust areas uh, itself because the focus was on areas that would be most relevant to the immediate location of comparative literature here. It was only in the 1970s and thereafter that Indian literatures become more important uh, a part, occupy more important a part within comparative literature. Uh, I'll just uh, take a minute. Please excuse me. I'll just get some water. Thank you. Hello, sir. Yes. Please let the lecture finish. Don't ask questions. <laughs> 
सर इज नॉट ऑडिबल टू अस Sir is taking a break. Can we please respect that? He has been presenting for the past one hour. Let's just wait. Yes, uh, I'm sorry. Thank you for your patience. Um, so, yes, as I was as I was suggesting, it is in the 1970s that we see the next major change in the way comparative literature is envisaged in India. In 1974, the uh, course in comparative Indian literature is started, and in 1978 there is a major curriculum reshuffle at Jadavpur. to include modern indian literatures more extensively in the syllabus so from this time onwards we see an attempt on the part of comparative literature to locate itself more squarely within the indian context and this is of course also tied up with other larger developments for uh, excuse instance excuse me sir excuse me yes. sir uh, yes. you could uh, you could uh, take questions now if you like that's really up to you if you want you could wind up and take questions it's entirely I'll, up i'll i'll do that please give me another 5 minutes to okay. just wind okay. up and and i will take questions yes okay so this was also tied up with larger developments at the national level enhanced focus on translating indian literature more translations were coming out that is why they could be uh incorporated within the syllabus if if we look at the work of comparatives around this time uh we will see that the kind of books the kind of works that were coming out were largely predicated on trying to locate comparative literature in the indian context amyo deb's work for instance the idea of comparative literature in india shapun mojumdar comparative literature indian dimensions and so on and so forth the attempt was in the 80s Uh, on trying to develop an indian comparative literature trying to locate comparative literature in the indian context other areas and trajectories that soon emerge after the 80s third world literatures become more and more important literary theory becomes more important as the humanities and the social sciences come begin to come closer to each other the study of the other arts becomes a uh, uh, sort of embodied within the syllabus these are some of the areas that enter the realms of comparative literature in the 80s and 90s uh there is one last point i will quickly uh, go over before opening this up i'd like to point you to the acla reports the american comparative literature association which has this tradition of uh, uh instituting commissions to understand the status of comparative literature at specific points of time So, for instance, in 1965, we saw the Levin Commission report. 1975, the Green Commission report, and in 1993, the Bernheimer Commission report. And these three reports have a very distinct stance vis-a-vis -vis reading and translation, which is something that becomes part and parcel of comparative literature in recent years. Uh, it is instructive to look at this difference because it has a certain relevance to understanding the Indian context of comparative literature. The first two. are taken from the levin report and the third one is from the green report and what will be clear to us if we take a casual reading through these is that there is some resistance to reading in translation the levin report goes as far as to call reading in translation second hand reading and the green report also suggests that comparative literature should be taught by people who have read the text in the original you cannot read in translation when we come to the bernheimer report however in the 1990s there is a volte face 
And the Bernheimer report suggests that although we must recognize the benefits of reading in original, we need to mitigate the old hostilities to translation because if we do not include the study of literature in translation within our curriculum, then the promise of comparative literature, the promise of a holistic understanding of literary culture across the world will be belied. So there is a movement from a hostility towards translation to embracing literature that would be taught in translation. And this is the last point with which I will end. It is curious to see that this argument is something that played out in the context of Indian comparative literature years ago, no, decades ago. Because this is a question that Buddhadev Boshu also deals with when comparative literature is first introduced in India. Because the question that he faces is, you are reading in translation. Is it possible to read literature in the university classroom in translation? And this is his answer. And the answer is this. You have two options. This is on the second page towards the end. One is free to choose between two alternatives. The grim satisfaction of struggling through a few pages of the original with grammar as the primary aim on one hand and on the other hand the enriching experience of racing through an author's inscape in a language one can easily comprehend so one option is to restrict ourselves to the languages that we know and try to pick up a language look at the text look at the dictionary and try to understand a text word by word and the other option is to give in to translation, which will allow us to understand the mind of the great writers of the world in translation. And Buddha Bushu concludes, the philologist will choose the former, but the humanist the latter. I think that is the justification that he gives for reading and translation in comparative literature. And one last question about when this is being written. The Bernheimer report is dated 1993. Buddha Boshu's answer to this question that has already come up in the Indian context of comparative literature is 1959. That's almost 40 odd years before US American comparative literature circles deal with this question. Perhaps in India, we were much more aware of the questions regarding translation and the need for translations for our literary studies because of our diversity. Because in the Indian context, we cannot think about a relevant curriculum for literary studies without thinking of translation itself. Thank you very much. I would be glad to take your inputs and uh, your questions. And uh, I'd, I'd be glad to learn from your experiences uh, on these issues. Sandhu, thank you very much. I have a question. Yes, yes, please. First of all, uh, it's a pretty and invite lecture. And um, for that, I'm thankful to you. My question is that um, Spivak one says in post-coloniality, every metropolitan definition is dislodged. So the general mode for the post-colonial is citation, reinscription, rerouting the historic. So do you think, uh, is there any crisis of comparative literature as it is theorized, taught, and practiced in North America and uh, perhaps other parts of the world in which European languages have taken root? I mean, it's essentially how to sustain the idea of Europe as the organizing principle of comparison in a post-European age. Yes, uh, thank you very much for that very important question. Uh, that's indeed something to think about. Uh, I'm not sure if I am uh, uh, well read enough to answer that question, but my response to that would be like this. I have never studied in North America. I have never taught in North America. I'm not particularly aware of the specific dynamics of comparative literature in North America, except from secondhand reading of books written by people who have taught and practiced comparative literature in the USA. My point would be, however, that when we are talking about literary studies in India, 
we tend to worry a little too much about what academics in the United States of America or in, the, or in Europe are thinking. Comparative literature in India has evolved along its own trajectory. There was an influence of Europe, uh, European idea of comparative literature in its early days, but because, and this is something I was trying to stress, because the Indian context is so different, the, the, the language map of India is so different, it is really imperative that we develop an Indian comparative literature which is different from the way comparative literature has been done elsewhere. That's one of the reasons some scholars have actually derided uh, Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak's uh, ideas about the crisis of comparative literature and so on and so forth. And several scholars have said that this is a very culture specific context that she's talking about. In the Indian context, there is no crisis at all of comparative literature. Rather, rather comparative literature has been on the rise because comparative literature initially was restricted to one department, was restricted to a few practitioners, was re restricted to one association, the Comparative Literature Association of India. But over the last 20, 30 years, particularly with the emergence of the central universities, which have been incorporated comparative literature within their curriculum, we have actually seen an emergence and enhanced visibility of comparative literature. So rather than there being any crisis, any reflection of the US American crisis on Indian humanities, our context, our experience has been quite the reverse. And the same, yes, of course, uh, Harish, Harish uh, has done that, Ipshita, uh, Professor Ipshita Chando has done that, there are many, many who have, who have done, done uh, you know, uh, gone along that route. Yes, so that would be my, my, my response. Sir, sir, I have a question. Uh, sir, have question is, uh, my question is very simple. The problem is here that if suppose if I want to do a comparative work for a Tamil author and I have read such English translations of these authors, uh, is it possible that we can get the real essence of these authors, whatever they have described in their work? Uh, if it is not possible for me that uh, I should know the language of Tamil or others. So is it possible that we can do uh, with the uh, translation of English, uh, those writers? Excellent, ma'am. That's a very, very relevant question. See, my response would be like this. Uh, Tamil Mori, Nalla Mori, Arakana Mori. Tamil language is uh, a beautiful language. It's, it's, it's a... Uh, very powerful language. So I would always encourage you to learn Tamil and do the work, if possible. But if that is not possible, you know, because it is not always possible for us to pick up languages at the drop of a hat. Language takes time to understand. Okay. And also there's a limit to how many languages we can learn. If we are looking for the whole picture, if we are looking for a holistic understanding about how different literatures evolve, about how a writer borrows from another, then we have no option but to look at translation. Yes, there are things that get lost in translation. Of course they do. Okay. Uh, but then we have said a lot of things about losses in translation. Perhaps we should also speak about gains in translation. There are things that sometimes get lost but there are things that we gain by reading translation. It's important to recognize that. Yes, of course, okay. as, as Professor Saleh has written. Yes. Good yes, morning, please. Sir, sir uh, during comparison, uh, what is important or who is important? Is it text or comparison maker? Suppose if a Western scholar and Indian scholar compares Bible and Gita, what basic differences may be seen? in the comparison of both scholars. Will their mindset affect the comparison? Yes, I think, I think first of all, we need to get rid of this idea that comparative literature is just comparison. As you are all aware, when we talk about comparative literature, what is our aim? What is our objective? Our objective is not just to take text A from one culture and text B from another culture and to compare them. The objective is to understand the larger network of relationships whereby world literature is produced. And there it is important to understand why we are comparing. There must be certain things in the two texts that connect them together so that we can compare them. This can be of two kinds. One can be 
in case of a direct influence, reception, impact, whereby one writer writes inspired by another writer. One text emerges as an influence of another text that exists earlier. The second model can be related not to influence, but to what is called polygenesis, which is we might not be able to prove any kind of Adan Pradhan, give and take, but there might be certain similarities among two texts that weren't a comparison. Okay. Now, how we deal with this comparison is, of course, up to the uh, uh, investigator, up to the researcher. I would not like to say that a foreign researcher would deal in a certain way, an Indian researcher would deal in a different way. It depends on the person concerned. Sometimes it is possible to have a foreign researcher who is well clued into the cultural nuances of the text concern. So it really, you cannot be prescriptive about this. I think it depends on uh, the, the person concerned, on the researcher concerned. I think there is uh, a question that has come up in the chat box from Professor Abu Saleh, which is a translator or a reader can read the same text in different ways and all the readings are right. Okay, that's not a question. That's a very, very interesting point that he makes. Yes, I would, I would probably yeah. agree with that because as we know from structuralist and post-structuralist theorists, reading is really a, a very complicated act and there are as many texts as there are readers and therefore there will be as many translators as many as many translations as there are translators so so yes therefore perhaps uh, we need to be flexible when we talk about reading in translations because a translation is merely another reading of the literary work it's just another text just as we would create our own text even though even if we were reading the text in the original language sir yes can, sir, i would like to ask this you one question this please, sir. The last hello? question please okay the last hello question. sir would you please clarify would you please clarify the point uh, the difference between in-depth study and in-breath study of course. Uh, yes. By in-depth study, one generally refers to uh, when we are studying perhaps uh, literary works that are written in one language across time. Okay. So when I'm doing English literature in the traditional sense of the word, in the traditional sense of the word, English literature studies would look at the development of literature in English across time chronologically. So that allows us to study this one literature more intensively. Okay. It has certain advantages. That's an in-depth study. As an alternative to this, you might have comparative literature, which might suggest a more in-breadth study, where the focus is not on understanding the development of literature in one language, but the focus is on connecting literary texts from different languages at the same time. That would be an in-breadth study. Yes. I, I think we should stop now. Sorry, ma'am. Uh, we should stop Sorry, ma'am. Sorry, ma'am. Uh, ma I'd like question. to thank uh, Professor Santan yes, for his extremely uh, informative, in-depth lecture. And we've all benefited from it. Thank you so much. I mean, it was a wonderful session, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, ma'am. Ma thank you. Ma'am, ma before close, let me, let me explain myself. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, thank you so much, sir. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'm leaving the meeting. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, sir. Hello, sir. Thank you, sir. Hello. Hello.
it seeks to transmit
Yes. Be underlining the work's importance. 